On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, what's next regarding the Titan Submersible? Hey, what's going on with shipping? Sal Mercagliano here. So it's been quite a week uh, for this story and myself, but I want to take a moment here and kind of recap where we are in the story and what is going to happen next, because there's a lot of information floating out there and a lot of things are not being put into the proper context. So I'm going to talk about five things here real quick. I want to talk about the classification of the submersible or lack thereof. Uh, I want to talk about the search and rescue that was undertaken to find the submersible. I want to talk about the Navy and their SOSIS array that heard the implosion and what that meant. I want to talk about the uh, investigation and where that's going to go. And then finally, I want to do a quick little thank you to everybody involved. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's talk about classification. So this was an unclassified submersible, meaning that there was no outside agency that went in and basically classified it. And what that is usually done for is insurance purposes. Usually you can't get insurance unless you have an outside agency come in and ensure that your submersible is not just built to withstand the rigor of the env uh, environment you're sending it into, but that there are periodic inspections and checks and, and all the things you need to ensure that it is operating properly. The, the closest I could come to an analogy here is getting your car inspected. You buy a car new, you assume it's working fine, but over time, it needs to be maintained. And what I am really want to know is who insured this expedition. Because whoever insured this expedition did so with the full knowledge that there was not a classification society giving their approval to this. And so I, I am wondering whether or not OceanGate has that. There are classifications for submersibles. There's a 273 page document put out by the American Bureau of Shipping on how to classify a submersible. The problem is that when OceanGate went to go get this submersible classified, it would have taken too long because it is such a radical and novel design. Most submersibles are round spherical objects, and then they have add-ons for the outside hull. But to get people inside this submersible, he had to go for a different design because you only put so many people inside a sphere. The only way to get more people in the sphere is make the sphere bigger. And so he went with this tube shape, and that meant putting titanium caps on a carbon fiber hull. And you're marrying together two different material, and more importantly, a material that has never been used before, carbon fiber, in this depth. And so you raise a lot of questions, and obviously the classification societies, ABS, DNV, Lloyd's, all had questions about this. And so did the industry. But again, this is pushing a new technology, and lots of times you have to push technologies to be able to advance in a field. However, you don't do that with passengers on board. Uh, this would have been an experimental craft used for surveying and searching, but not for paid passengers, even though he called them mission specialists. And understand where this is different, if you look at SpaceX and those space exploration companies, they take off from the United States, they land in the United States, they fall under the Federal Aviation Administration. The FAA has oversight over them. This submersible was launched out in the deep ocean in international waters off a Canadian ship out of a Canadian port. There is no oversight. There are no boat cops coming up to the submersible and asking to see your license, registration, and classification society. However, I do think that Canada is going to have a role in this. We're going to come back to that. All right, second. SOS. So the Polar Prince, the ship they operated off, sent out a mayday after eight hours after they realized that, okay, this, this submersible is well overdue. They sent out an SOS, which ironically comes from Titanic. Uh, the Titanic was the one that really started this off. And because of the safety of life at sea convention that was held two years after the Titanic disaster, Everyone has to render aid. There's no choice in this. And so what you got was ships in the area responded. The U.S. Coast Guard, the Canadian Coast Guard, and other assets were deployed to the area. And there's a lot of issues about cost with this. Let me be clear. The U.S. agencies, the Canadian agencies, will not bill you for saving anyone. They won't. The Coast Guard will respond what assets they need and deploy them, and they will assume that cost. I've been a volunteer firefighter for 20 years. I don't get to choose on what calls I go to. They dispatch us out, and we go. If it's because of an accident, that's great. We go. If it's because of someone's stupid negligence, we still go. And that's what happens here. You go no matter what the situation is. So the Coast Guards from both countries respond. Now, 
When it comes to the use of ROVs and private equipment, that's a little bit different because that's going to be contracted by the Coast Guard. The U.S. Coast Guard, for example, has no deep submergence vehicles, which is freaking stupid, but that's what happens because they don't have the budget to them because they're the most underfunded agency, I would argue, in the U.S. government in many ways when it comes to uh, maritime rescue. I mean, they're just it. I mean, they just they, they are the premier maritime rescue agency, and they operate on a budget that's ridiculous. So they have to contract for that. Same thing with the Canadian Coast Guard. And there's going to be liens or, or payments directed toward Ocean Gate for the salvage. And again, this goes back to the insurance. One of the reasons why you classify a vessel is to have insurance. And I am not sure Ocean Gate survives this. I'm not sure Horizon Maritime, the company that operated the uh, parent vessel, will survive either because they have a liability issue in this. All right, point three. The U.S. Navy detects the implosion. You see that in the headline everywhere. All right, let me be clear about what's called SOSIS. This is the uh, underwater array that operates at the bottom of the ocean, designed during the Cold War, declassified. The existence of it was declassified in the 90s, but it's still in operation today. So this is a, a series of underwater listening devices serviced by the U.S. Navy. There are specialized ships like the U.S. and Zeus that go out there and, 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 and uh, take care of these arrays. Uh, but let me be clear about something here, because you're hearing everyone talk about that the Navy heard the implosion. All right. There is not a room full of people with headphones on listening to the ocean uh, like in, you know, Crimson Tide and, and Hunt for Red October. That, that doesn't happen. What SOSIS does is collect data. I mean, reams of data. I mean, just just terabytes of data. And what probably happened in this scenario is that the Navy was asked, okay, we have a submersible missing in this area. Did you hear anything? And it's not like they would have heard it at the time. What they would have to do is go back through the data, cull through it, and try to find an anomaly in the background of the data from that location. Now, an implosion, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, you would have heard the implosion. We heard the implosion of Scorpion and Thresher. These were nuclear submarines. We heard the uh, implosion of Russian submarines, K-129, and all these other ones that were out there. Those are big, huge, honking metal submarines, you know, several hundred feet long, thousands of tons. Titan is a submersible the size of a minivan, 20-something feet long, made out of uh, uh, carbon fiber and titanium caps. This would have been, I hate to say it, a pop in the ocean. And it probably was a type of sound not really recorded in the past ever before. So the best the Navy would have been able to do is differentiate, yeah, we heard a sound at this time from this general area. And understand, you don't get a pinpoint location. Even if you triangulate and you have three different points and you come to a nice little X, that's not the way sound works. Sound doesn't travel in a straight line like light. It, 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 it meanders, it bends, it, it has to deal with salinity and density and pressure and all these other factors. And so what you get is a search area, a, you know, an area to go look around, but it doesn't give you a pinpoint. And it's not because, well, we heard this sound, call off the search, it was an implosion. You heard an anomaly. It is, you know, it is, it is a sea of Waldos with one Waldo having their hat tilted one way and every other Waldo the other way. And you got to find that one tilted Waldo. It's not easy to find. All right, fourth, investigation. So now begins the investigation. And we just heard uh, yesterday that the Canadian uh, Transportation Board, with the assistance of the U.S. National uh, Transportation Safety Board, will be conducting the primary investigation. So why are assets still on location with ROVs? Number one, they're not going back to claim bodies. Uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad news here, but a implosion at that depth would absolutely destroy any living organism. Uh, it's just, it, it, there's nothing left. Uh, what you are going to find is remnants of the submersible. And understanding what happened to the submersible is really key. So for example, the landing gear, the outside legs of it, uh, they were found. We know that because they talk about that. But the question is, what kind of condition were they in? Are they intact, meaning that they were dropped by the submersible on the way down? One of the ways they had to shed weight on the submersible was to drop the landing gear. 
Uh, understand, submersibles and, and submarines operate in a very unique thing. They're not the, gravity is a, is is a positive for them, not a negative. Airplanes, gravity is the problem. It's going to pull you down. In case of uh, submersibles, buoyancy is your is in your favor. All you do is shed weight and you bounce up to the surface. And so while this thing had weight strapped to it, there's a lot of you know images of those pipes strapped to the side. It could also drop some of the external equipment on it. And so if those legs have been dropped, you know, if you find those legs intact on the bottom, that tells you, number one, that they were shedding weight, that, that they realized there was a problem. And so they were dropping weight on the way down. If those legs are mangled, then they were on when the vessel imploded. And so that tells you a lot right there. If those legs are on there, they, they implode and they shred, where are they on the ocean bottom? If they're close together, that would tell you that the submersible was close to bottom when this happened. If they're over a large distance, that tells you that they blew off and then had a float down and were impacted by current and water. So you get a lot of data from this. They're going to want to re retrieve as much as they can. Now, some of these objects are heavy. Those titanium caps are really heavy. So they're going to have to do something with buoyancy lift to bring them up. What they really want to find more than anything else is the tube, the, the carbon fiber tube that connects between the two caps at the end and see what kind of condition it's in. You know, is it one elongated thing that's been crunched down and shrunk down? Is it is it in pieces? Has it just come apart? Did it delaminate? Did it, you know, what, what kind of condition it is? Because believe it or not, we've had instances where aircraft submersibles and submarines have been lost, not submersibles, actually submersibles are one of the safest things in the world. But we've had submarines lost where you learn from, okay, this technology can work, but we just applied it the wrong way. And so it's really important to get this because submersibles, again, are the safest craft we know of. Since the 1960s, there's never been a loss at deep submergence ever. It just doesn't happen. The only time I could ever think anyone has ever seen anything like this is in all things, the movie Raise the Titanic, where there's actually a deep submergence vehicle that is lost while trying to raise the Titanic in that movie and that book. Uh, but it just doesn't happen. So the investigation is really important. It's going to help us piece together what happened because you do, don't advance a technology without looking at what went wrong in the past. And this went wrong, obviously. It, it, it tragically went wrong. The reason the classification societies would not class this vessel is because of the different material used in it, the technology going with this tube shape. And let's be clear why they went with the tube shape. They went with the tube shape because they want to put people in this thing. They designed this specifically to dive on Titanic, and you have to put people in it. And a lot of reasons why there weren't a lot of safety and rescue gear on this, you know, redundant communication systems, an emergency beacon, uh, you know, additional safety features is on a submersible, you have two parameters. You got power and you got weight. Anything that consumes power reduces your bottom time because once you start running out of power, you got to go back up. The other thing is if you put more weight on, you got to shed weight off. And the only thing that can be shed in weight off this thing is paying passengers. I hate to say it, but that's true. That's what you have. And so I think this investigation is going to be really interesting to watch it unfold. As the fragments come up, we really, uh, really want to see what condition these fragments are in, what they collect, what they bring up. Ideally, this is a very small submersible. They should be able to bring everything up as long as they can find it. But the question is, where is it located in the area? I want to go back to one other thing here, too, because I, I, I failed to mention this. Once they got the position of where that implosion happened, they had to wait for ROVs to get on location. Uh, one of the faults in Ocean Gate is they didn't have an ROV on that platform, on Polar Prince, to go down. So they had to wait for ROVs to get down. And obviously, they would have started searching in and around Titanic first. But again, searching in and around Titanic is a long process. It's an 800-foot-long ship that's broken into three major parts. It's spread over a great distance. And I know you've seen videos where you can see Titanic and it's like beautiful visibility. That's not always the case. We don't know what visibility was in the bottom there at the time. So you could have good visibility where you can see, you know, a couple of, you know, dozen yards, maybe 100 yards in front of you, but very unlikely. More than likely, you had really lousy visibility, especially when you're searching the bottom because you get silt kicked up by the ROVs. And it takes you literally, it's like a flashlight walking a football field at night and you're trying to find a pin, you know, that little remnant 
there. It takes time. You have to go up and down very methodically. You can't jump around and you're looking for that debris field. It's a very tough thing to find. And finding these remnants, these fragments, especially if the RO, especially if the submersible uh, imploded at depth, uh, about you know two thirds of the way down, a half of the way down, it's going to be scattered over a large area. Finally, last thing. Thank you. Uh, this channel has been on for over two years and four months. And during this tragedy, we hit the 100,000 subscriber mark. Now, I'm going to do a video that thanks everybody properly about this. We're going to get back to our regular broadcast on commercial shipping and global transportation on the oceans here very shortly and get back to it. But uh, I have been nonstop doing interviews, talking uh, with people, with agencies, with, with uh, the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, with the LA Times, you name it, and then doing TV uh, interviews around. And I'm not bragging about that. It's not, I'm, I'm not at all saying that. Uh, there's a lot more qualified people than me they can be talking to out there. But I think one of the reasons that I get contacted is because of those of you who watch this video, share this video, get it out there. Uh, we have grown from 136 subscribers the day I started this, which is when Ever Given went sideways in the Suez back in March of 2021 to over 100,000 subscribers today. And I think uh, in many ways, uh, you allowed me, uh, quote unquote, subject matter expert, I hate that term, I really don't like being called an expert in anything, uh, to be uh, called in and give my perspective on these issues, which I try to stay measured. I try not ever to talk outside my scope of knowledge and stay in my lane as much as I can. But I do try to provide as, as much information as I can. I want to thank everybody for tuning in uh, today. If you can, hey, if, and if you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button so that we can continue to grow this channel. Uh, leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You can hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon and become a patron of the page. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off.